The whole debate on hydroxychloroquine has taken a really dark, very ugly turn, and we're going to explore that today. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Chris Martinson. I'm here with your update for COVID-19, a.k.a. the honey badger virus. Why? Well, because this thing is a, a real beast and you don't want to get it. Uh, looks looks fun, looks tame, but it's really not a, a good virus to get at all. Today's title, hydroxychloroquine and a profound lack of integrity. Let's get into it. But first, uh, I got a question of the day today coming from Doug Skeggs of Ontario, Canada, who said it was okay to use his name and location. Uh, hi, Chris. Feel free to use my full name and location. Oh, I just said that. I've been following the chloroquine conversation since I first heard it mentioned, I think, mid-February. The alarming warnings about the drug have puzzled me because I've taken chloroquine for weeks at a time, many times, mostly in the late 80s, early 90s, as a malaria prophylactic while traveling extensively in South and Southeast Asia. This was a routine anti-malarial at the time. I don't recall any doctor ever telling me about potential side effects. As I've listened to the conversation, it also occurred to me that chloroquine was the anti-malarial drug given to millions of American soldiers during the Vietnam War. It appears U.S. soldiers in Vietnam were given chloroquine and or primiquin and or quinine as anti-malarials. One of the things I find puzzling while trying to follow the current conversation is the hydroxy part of hydroxychloroquine. To add to my confusion, coincidentally, I returned to Vietnam in late January this year and was there for eight weeks during February to March as COVID circled the globe. I followed your channel daily while I was in Vietnam. The information you provided was very helpful in allowing me to assess and manage my risk with some confidence while traveling. Prior to this 2020 trip to Vietnam, I consulted a travel health clinic. I was prescribed and advised to take Mylan Avitoquinone Proguanil as a daily antimalarial, which I did. I was warned of several potential side effects that were referred to as possibly uncomfortable but not serious. No reference related to anything related to heart function now. Looking around the web, I see references to hydroxychloroquine as Plaquenil, slightly different spelling from the drug I was prescribed. So I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about chloroquine and its different forms. I'd be happy to, Doug. Let's take a look. Chloroquine as the anti-malarial common in the 80s, 90s. Hydroxychloroquine and Plaquenil slash Proguanil. Are they different? How? All right. Good questions, Doug. I'd like to help demystify this. Yes, they are different. Uh, they are different chemical structures. So let's take a peek at them. Uh, Proguanil looks like this, and it's uh, got a benzene ring here, a chlorine off the side, uh, then an amino group, and another amino group, another, another, another. So, wow, that thing's really heavy on the nitrogen. So that's what that looks like. Uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are going to look almost identical to you unless you notice this little hydroxy group coming off here. So this is chloroquine itself, and this is hydroxychloroquine. Again, pretty much identical except for this little OH group stuck off to the side of that last terminal carbon uh, on that ring right there. So not ring on, on that uh, uh, moiety there. So as we look at these, these are very different things. So back to your question, Plaquenil is hydroxychloroquine. It's very different from Proguanil. So those are two separate things that you are looking at here. Plaquenil is, oh, let me get this different. Come on, select. Ah, Plaquenil is different from Proguanil. Okay. So this is uh, Plaquenil here. It's called hydroxychloroquine. And uh, Proguanil is this thing over here. I don't know anything about Proguanil. I've never studied its safety profile. Uh, look, haven't looked at it. Don't know anything about it at this point in time. Uh, I had to find that out when I was researching your question. All right. I'm going to talk today about that Lancet study that came out recently. Uh, we talked about it two days ago on Tuesday. Today is Thursday. Uh, May 28th here. And it's this study, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without a macrolide. That would be azithromycin or other macrolide for treatment of COVID-19. A multinational registry analysis from Professor Mandeep Mehra here, MD, Sepan S. Desai, MD, Professor Frank Rushichka, MD, and Amit N. Patel, MD here. Here's the uh, link to that particular um study right there. And as well, I want to notice here that uh, one of some of the effects that came off of that. So this big study comes out and it was an observational study. It was published in Lancet nearly, it was 92,000, nearly 100,000 patients in 671 hospitals across six continents. Mm -hmm. Suggested hydroxychloroquine promoted by the controversial French infectious disease specialist Didier Raoult might increase mortality rates. And because of that, 
France, Italy, Belgium, all taking steps against the use of hydroxychloroquine. France banning it outright. Italy banning it, right? Uh, in treating patients with COVID-19 as safety concerns over the drug. Touted by Donald Trump and Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro continue to grow. Paris on Wednesday revoked a decree allowing doctors to use the drug with severely ill coronavirus patients, while the Italian and Belgian medicine agencies either suspended or warned against its use, except in clinical trials. And this comes uh, days after the World Health Organization suspended a global trial of the drug, citing safety concerns from what? Well, all because of this study here. We're going to take another closer look at this study because something really stinks in this right now. I mean, really stinks. This is uh, embarrassingly bad. I am a little bit ashamed for uh, science is a thing that I associated with. I feel like I need to distance myself from science if this is how it's going to be conducted. Again, I don't have any particular dog in this fight. I don't have any financial arrangements anywhere. I'm not here to promote hydroxychloroquine. I'm here to take apart bad science, particularly politicized medicine. These things have no business and no place in a world where we want to operate with compassion, with reason, with care, all of that. I am still asking for the same thing I've been asking for the whole time. Give me, please, a randomized, double-blind, controlled, placebo-controlled trial for hydroxychloroquine that is administered early in the symptomology cycle, right? Not hospital admission cycle, early in the symptom cycle, along with zinc. Give me that, and if it doesn't work... I will change my tune. But this was being used, this study. So let's look at this a little bit further. It led to Fauci just today coming out saying hydroxychloroquine not effective against coronavirus. NIAID Diseases Director, Infectious Diseases Director Anthony Fauci on Wednesday became the first Trump administration official to say definitively that HCQ is not an effective treatment for coronavirus based on the available data. The scientific data is really quite evident now about the lack of efficacy, Fauci, the U.S. government's top infectious disease expert, said on CNN. But he stopped short of calling for an outright ban of the drug, which President Trump said he was taking last week as a preventative measure after a top White House aide was diagnosed with the coronavirus. And Fauci's comments come days after The Lancet published a 96,000 patient observational study that concluded hydroxychloroquine had no effect on COVID-19 and may have even caused some harm. The WHO went a little step further and tells Indonesia to stop using HCQ. How about that? Indonesia has been told by the World Health Organization to stop using HCQ in the treatment of patients with COVID-19. Stop. You must stop. They're pointing their finger at them. You must do what we say. The Jakarta Post reported that the WHO sent an advisory to Indonesia's Ministry of Health stating that use of the drugs for such treatment should be halted due to safety concerns. Again, isn't this a little odd? Hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine have been used for decades, 70 years, without any safety concerns. Suddenly, huge, huge safety concerns here. This decision follows the results of a study, uh, same one. So you can see the impact of this study. So let's look at this a little bit more closely because... I think the headline's going to give it away. It appears to be a complete fiction. All right. Uh, this comes from a Twitter feed from uh, this user here. Arkansas is real. He's MD, PhD. So this is a researcher type of person. Um, and they write here, and this all struck had the ring of truth for me because I've been in the world of data uh, before and I've worked in, uh, in, in the, well, that's, you know, I came from pharma business a long time ago where I worked in uh, the corporate finance side, but I'm pretty aware of the, um, types of data collection that goes on in the big world of clinical trials because I was working on the research side of everything and I saw uh, what they went through on that side. All right. Uh, first, the study says they received data from 600 hospitals up to mid-April, actually the number 671, and it was published by the end of May. So month and a half. This is impossible. If you've ever collected clinical research data, you will know how impossible it is. Well, that was one of the things that jumped out at me, right? How many authors were on this particular study? Just four. Normally, to, to pour through 96,000 patient records, there would be a string of names so long you'd, get, you'd glaze over before you could read them all. And by the way, uh, this is right here. Uh, Desai here is the person who got all the data. This is a cardiologist. This is a cardiologist. This is a cardiologist. It's kind of weird you don't have a single infectious disease doctor on here. You don't have a single statistician on here. And this is a big statistical study. Um, there's a, I mean, you're really, this is a very odd grouping of people. 
on here uh, to be pushing out this particular study. But no matter, look at the damage or, or effect it already had. So uh, you have to get doctors to enter information. So that's how the information gets in the system in the first place. It doesn't magically go in the system, right? Doctors have to enter it, and they are completely unreliable, which is true. Uh, I've, I've worked with um, <laughs> requiring to be chased all the time. If you've ever seen this, uh, yeah, trying to get doctors to finish their paperwork and get it into the system. Like they're in the middle of all this big crisis. They're treating patients. They're doing all of that. The patient records are sort of piling up all over the place. Some of them are on paper. Some of them are going into tablets. Uh, but at any rate, to close out those patient records uh, is uh, – anyway, it can be a challenge. If you're lucky, some units have a research nurse who's much better, but the data reports are either on paper, needing mailing or faxing, or in an electronic repository. Electronic repositories are faster, but you need ethical approval, suitable web server setup, access set up for each hospital and ideally each worker. This is what the authors say happened. They say they questioned existing repositories. So this is a, um, a piece that was pulled out from that study. And let's take a look at it here. Um, the Surgical Outcomes Collaborative, hereafter referred to as the Collaborative, ensures compliance with the U.S. FDA Guidance on Real World Evidence, RWE. That's a thing. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Real world data are collected through automated data transfers that capture 100% of the data from each healthcare entity at regular predetermined levels, thus reducing the impact of selection bias and missing values and ensuring that the data are current reliable, relevant. Verifiable source documentation for the elements include electronic inpatient and outpatient medical records and, in accordance with the FDA guidance on relevance of real-world data, data acquisition is performed through use of a standardized Health Level 7 compliant data dictionary with data collected on a prospective ongoing basis. All right, is that possible? Let's read on. I'm sorry, but these don't exist. Repositories do exist and maintain some of this data, but it's mostly unlinked, relies on it being filled in correctly, and exists on different systems that don't talk to each other. Add in different countries, and this stuff is just not accessible. You add in different countries, and I'll tell you, that it becomes exponentially harder to think about how you're going to gather all that data. They are trying to claim that they are able to access this information in other countries, but... One, on all clinical record systems, information is always patchy. Ex-smoker, BMI, and current medications are notoriously not present. So, hey, every country does it a different way. Heck, even different hospitals might do it a different way. You've got all these different systems out there. Uh, you got people putting things in, so there's people involved. And uh, so data collection, you know, garbage in, garbage out. It's always tricky how you're going to get the best possible data, but... Um, this is going to be really, really tricky data from so many different countries. Uh, and then two, for each hospital system providing access, you have to go through a complex ethical approval, ethics approval system. Otherwise, your hospital's just giving your personal data to some strangers. And this does not happen quickly, if at all. We are talking months to set up. It might be possible with completely de-identified data, but you'd have to tell me why the hospitals would be motivated to share their de-identified data with uh, this company that gathered them all. And we're going to get into that company in just a second. Even if you get ethics approval, then you would have to implement a system in your PAS, your patient admin system, that allows external access. This is really frowned upon in all Western countries. So those are some good points that Arkansas is real uh, made out here. But let's go now to a Guardian article that just came out today that says, hey, questions were raised over hydroxychloroquine study which caused the WHO to halt trials immediately for COVID-19, says here, questions have been raised by Australian infectious disease researchers about a study published in The Lancet, which prompted the WHO to halt global trials of the drug HCQ to treat COVID-19. The study published on Friday found COVID-19 patients who received the malaria drug were dying at higher rates and experienced more heart-related complications than other virus patients. Remember that heart-related piece? We're going to get to a really interesting piece of data around that in just a minute. The large observational study analyzed data from nearly 15,000 patients with COVID-19 who received the drug alone or in combination with antibiotics, comparing this data with 81,000 controls who did not receive the drug. The findings prompted researchers from around the world to reassess their own clinical trials for the drug of the drug, 
for preventing and treating COVID-19. The WHO halted all its trials involving hydroxychloroquine due to the concerns raised in the study about its efficacy and safety. It was once viewed as among the most promising medicines to treat the virus, though no study to date has found this to be the case. That's not true, and I'll show you how that's not true. And the drug can have toxic side effects, but <laughs> only recently, over the past 70 years, as, uh, as our opening uh, question uh, reader of the day said, they, I got hundreds, I literally have hundreds of stories just like this where people say, you know, that's funny because I've been to all these countries. I've been given hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine a lot of times. It's been handed over the counter even. It's just been given out like candy. Nobody's ever said, oh, watch out for the super dangerous cardiac side effects. We're going to have to monitor you for those. All right. Um, and the Australian Department of Health had been stockpiling millions of doses of the drug just in case clinical trials found it to be useful. All right, let's go on. Um, this is continuing in that Guardian article. The study led by the Brigham and Women's Hospital Center for Advanced Heart Disease in Boston. Oh, are those cardiologists finding a lot of cardiac effects in uh, the data? That's weird. <laughs> I wonder if there's any connection there. We'll find out in a minute. Examined patients in hospitals around the world, including in Australia. It said researchers gained access to data from five hospitals recording 600 Australian COVID-19 patients and 73 Australian deaths as of 21st April. That's what the study said. So gain data from five hospitals. But data from Johns Hopkins University shows only 67 deaths from COVID-19 had been recorded in Australia by 21 April. Huh. Those are different numbers, if you'll notice, 21, 20, 20, 67 and 73. The number did not rise to 73 until the 23rd of April. The data relied upon by researchers to draw their conclusions in The Lancet is not readily available in Australian clinical databases, leading many to ask where it came from. What? Let's read that more slowly. The data relied upon by researchers to draw their conclusions in The Lancet is not readily available in Australian clinical databases, leading many, including myself, to ask, where did that come from? That's a good question. The Federal Health Department confirmed to Guardian Australia that the data collected on notifications of COVID-19 in the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System was not the source for the incoming trial. So, mm, did not come from the Federal Health Department. Didn't, that's not, didn't come from there. Where did it come from? Let's keep reading. Guardian Australia also contacted the health departments of Australia's two most populous states, New South Wales and Victoria, which have had by far the largest number of COVID-19 infections between them. Of the Australian deaths reported by 21 April, 14 were in Victoria and 26 in North South, New South Wales, right? Um, hmm. So, yep, the, the, the hospitals in question ought to have been in that, uh, have to have been in that data set somewhere. Victoria's department confirmed the study's results relating to the Australian data did not reconcile with the state's coronavirus data including hospital admissions and deaths. Oops. Uh-oh. That's a big that's a big red flag right there. If I could draw a flag, it would be look like this. This is a flag. I'm drawing a flag here. Flag. Yeah. Big red flag on that one. All right, let's keep going. The uh, New South Wales Department. Oop. Wrong marker. Let me get my other marker. The New South Wales Department of Health also confirmed it did not provide the researchers with the data for its databases. Uh oh, <laughs> they didn't provide the data for the databases. Where did the data come from? The Lancet told Guardian Australia, we have asked the authors for clarifications. We know they are investigating urgently and we await their reply. The lead author of the study, Dr. Dr. Mandeep Mehra, said he had contacted Surgisphere, the company that provided the data, to reconcile the discrepancies with the utmost urgency. Surgisphere is described as a healthcare data analytics and medical education company. Hmm. That's right. Let's go a little further. Uh, the, uh, yeah, let me just get rid of this so it's not in our way. Um, this is continuing that Guardian article here. It says, The Lancet told Guardian Australia, We have asked the authors for clarifications. We know that they are investigating urgently. We await their reply. The lead author of the study, Dr. Mandeep Mehra, said he had contacted Surgisphere. Uh, oh, wait, I read that. Uh, sorry. In a statement, Surgisphere, Surgisphere founder Dr. Sapan Desai, also an author on the paper, said a hospital from Asia 
had accidentally been included in the Australian data. That is, that's supposed to describe the discrepancy. Read this right here. See, see if this doesn't set off your BS meter. It pegged mine like all the way, bright red, far to the right. We have reviewed our Surgisphere database and discovered that a new hospital that joined the registry on April 1st and self-designated as belonging to the Australasia Continental Designation said in reviewing the data from each of the hospitals in the registry, we noted that this hospital had a nearly 100% composition of Asian race and a relatively high use of chloroquine compared to non-use in Australia. This hospital should have more appropriately been assigned to the Asian continental designation. He said the error did not change the overall study findings. It did mean blah, 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 blah. Get, yeah, uh, this is uh, this kind of reads to me like um, the kind of excuse you get from your five-year-old when they've got their hands behind their back and there's cookie crumbs on the floor right behind them. Um, that's what that reads to me like, but hey, let's wait for this to unfold a little further. Dr. Alan Chang, an epidemiologist and infectious disease doctor with Alfred Health in Melbourne, said the Australian hospitals involved in the study should be named. He said he had never heard of Surgisphere, and no one from his hospital, the Alfred, had provided Surgisphere with data. I'll put another word in there, with any data. No data. Um, usually to submit to a database like Surgisphere, you need ethics approval. Yep, that's true. And someone from the hospital will be involved in that process to get it to a database, he said. He said the data set uh, should be made public or at least open to an independent statistical reviewer. If they got this wrong, what else could be wrong? Cheng asked. Good question. It was also a red flag to him that the paper only listed four authors. Me too. Big, big red flag. Usually studies that report on findings from thousands of patients, you would see a large list of authors on the paper. He said multiple sources are needed to collect and analyze the data for large studies. And usually you see that acknowledged in the list of authors. Ooh, man, there's just red flags all over the place. All right, let's go back to Arkansas's, uh reading of this because this was really cool. Uh, confirming that uh, they continue in their thread here. And ethics approval of this magnitude would take months but it would take even longer to get the system up and running to allow secure access to hospital data systems externally. It just does not happen. Feel free to try and navigate the rules and regulations uh, for NSW Australia yourself. Nice link here. Uh, trust me, it's pretty tough. And here is the COVID-19 specific guidance, um, which they give here. The reason it's complex is to protect patient privacy and ensure that the ethics are followed, which go all the way back to the Nuremberg Code. So let's ask a question then. Um, who is Surgisphere? Let's take a deeper peek into that because this is where all the data comes from. So this is certainly something we should be looking at. I found this here. Uh, this was an article by Mustafa ben <coughs> Benhenda here uh, from May 26. And uh, it really arguing that the, the way that this overhyped study in Lancet um, is really in bad shape because it, it's uh, black box data. So again, remember I said we get back to this idea of real world evidence. It, it's a it's a, a a method of going out and collecting lots and lots of data out of the real world and seeing what you can find. And I'm not against it. It's just got to be done right. So um, Mustafa writes here, the use of real world evidence in COVID-19 is growing. That's a good thing. Properly implemented RWE has the potential to deliver solid results faster than randomized controlled trials, as he's explained in a previous blog post. So I couldn't miss the largest observational study published to date on the effects of hydroxychloroquine in 96,032 hospitalized COVID-19 patients from an international registry comprising 671 hospitals in six continents. And uh, here again are the names of the authors and... Um, went in the Lancet. Unfortunately, this paper is an example of real-world evidence and big data implemented in the wrong way. Data is powerful, but not a magic bullet, and this kind of low-quality literature is my inspiration for launching the COVID Consortium of Individual Patient Data. So they've got a, 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 an initiative underway to try and uh, actually use real-world data in the right way. They went through a bunch of uh, good art, uh, reasons. There's three big reasons why this was uh, conducted all in the wrong way, but let's go deeper. Second reason was no data traceability. This Lancet paper also has no data traceability. Authors didn't release the names of people who were responsible for data collection in hospitals. That's the second black box. 
The first black box um, was they said, oh, yeah, we can't share our database with you. You can't look at it. Um, so you're just going to have to trust us that we did it all right and uh, our conclusions are good. The paper has only four co-authors, ridiculously small for medical literature standards, and only one person who was responsible for data acquisition. Just one. Sapan S. Desai. How could he curate a huge data set of 96,032 patients alone so quickly? Is his company Surgisphere magical? Is Surgisphere... Surgisphere has only six employees on LinkedIn. That's insane. Yep, sure enough, you go over to LinkedIn, Surgisphere Corporation there, uh, six employees, and um, it describes itself here. It says, Surgisphere claims to be a leader in healthcare data analytics, but their LinkedIn posts have only one like, and it was a self-like. <laughs> and, and their oldest post is two months old. This bold and shady company seems a bit early stage for leadership claims. It's not the Google of health data. Hmm. All right, I'm going to get back to Surgisphere just a little bit more in, in a minute, but uh, let's just keep going on with the Arkansas thread. Uh, and continuing on now, Arkansas says, this gives more of a breakdown of the data and uses something called propensity matching. This is a method of matching up similar patients, which is a good thing, right? So um, it, that's, uh, I'm not against it. If done right, it's it's what you need to do. So uh, he says, so for instance, you want to get the same proportions of black versus white patients in each group, same for BMI, smoking, all that. So if you could, the best way to, to do something like this, you go in and you fish through thousands of patient records and you say, gosh, can I just compare um, African-American males with a BMI of 25 against some other group with a set of characteristics? So each one of those um, characteristics is, uh, by the way, going to exclude more and more and more people from your pool. Each time you do this for each factor, you reduce the pool of patients to compare. So to get the same number of black, non-smoking, BMI, 25 hypertensive patients in each group is really tough. That's five factors. This group did it with 23 factors and all matched up perfectly. That's what we were looking at uh, on Tuesday. Look at this. Look at this. Apparently, uh, out of a pool of 90,000 patients, they were able to find 3,783 in each of these two groups with uh, none taking no chloroquine or second generation macrolide or a group that did. And look at this. The ages were 55.0 compared to 54.9, the exact same standard deviations on that whole thing. The BMI, 28.1 compared to 28.2. Uh, Female, 1,721 to 1,718. Uh, 2,412 compared to 2,418. 375 compared to 369. Hispanic, 287 compared to 273. Uh, wow. Able to match all of these things, uh, including... Um, and by the way, I just I just want to note here something a little odd. See all this? See all the comorbidities? See the cardiac arrhythmia here? Look at that. Apparently, even though... These are all being conducted in hospitals of, of great repute. Um, people with uh, actual comorbidities that would normally exclude you from hydroxychloroquine as a consideration were in there. Huh, that's kind of weird to me, uh, but I'm no heart doctor, heart doctors. Uh, but at any rate, this is just, look at all, and by the way, I had to cut this table off. There's 23 separate uh, factors that they managed to fish through a database of just 96,000 and magically found 3,783 on both sides of the aisle uh, exactly matching. Um, the likelihood of that is vanishingly small. And so there was an open letter to the Lancet already penned about this particular study. Geno Smith, thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. And because uh, I put out a little, a little plea to the brain trust of Twitter and said, please help me understand this uh, all a little bit better. And this came back and I like this. So um, let's, let's quick take a peek at that letter right now. Uh, let's, let's look at this because uh, this is really, really kind of good. All right. This is an open letter to the authors of this big study and to Richard Horton, who is the editor of The Lancet. And they talk here uh, about concerns regarding statistical analysis and data integrity. Um, let's see. The retrospective observational study of 96,032 hospitalized COVID-19 patients from six continents reported substantially increased mortality in excess of 30% excess deaths and occurrence of cardiac arrhythmias associated with the use of four aminoquinoline drugs, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. These results have had a considerable impact on public health practice and research. 
Yeah, they have. I just showed you all that data, right? France and Italy and all these studies being suspended. This research had a huge impact. The WHO has paused recruitment to the hydroxychloroquine arm in their solidarity trial. The UK regulatory body, the MHRA, requested the temporary pausing of recruitment to all HCQ trials in the UK. France has changed its national recommendation um, and halted trials. The subsequent media headlines have caused considerable concern to participants and patients enrolled in randomized consider controlled trials seeking to characterize the potential benefits and risks of these drugs. All right. There is uniform agreement that well-conducted RCTs are needed to inform policies and practices. Yeah, let's say it. I like how these people are writing. This impact has led many researchers around the world to scrutinize in detail the publication in question. This scrutiny has raised both methodological and data integrity concerns. The main concerns are listed as follows. And oh, my God, these are just, from a science standpoint, this is horrifying stuff in here. I mean, it's just ridiculous. There was inadequate adjustment for known and measured confounders, disease severity, temporal effects, side effects, dose used. Ooh, inadequate adjustment for that stuff, huh? The authors have not adhered to standard practices in the machine learning and statistics community. They have not released their code or data. There is no data or code sharing and availability statement in the paper. The Lancet, as a reminder, was among the many signatories on the welcome statement on data sharing for COVID-19 studies, which this violates that statement, of course. There was no ethics review. <clears throat> what? There was no ethics review? That's pretty bad. Four, there was no mention of the countries or hospitals that contributed to the data source and no acknowledgments to their contributions. Ooh, that is a, that's a couple of double fouls in science land. You always uh, want to give uh, acknowledgments for contributions. A request to the authors for information on contributing centers was denied. Pass denied. None for you. No, we're not going to tell you how we got this stuff. We can't. You know, it's, it's proprietary. Data from Australia are not compatible with government reports. Um, too many cases for just five hospitals. More in-hospital deaths than it occurred in the entire country during the study period, blah, blah, blah. Surgisphere, the data company, have since stated this was an error of classification of one hospital from Asia. This indicates the need for further error checking throughout the database, and that's being polite. Data from Africa, here we go. I told you I'd get back to this um, cardiac uh, business here and uh, the, ven the ventricular arrhythmias and stuff. Data from Africa indicate that nearly 25% of all COVID-19 cases and 40% of all deaths in the continent occurred in Surgisphere associated hospitals, which had sophisticated electronic patient data recording and patient monitoring able to detect and record non-sustained, at least six seconds, or sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Both the numbers of cases and deaths and the detailed data collection seem unlikely. Yeah, because you know what? You need very specialized equipment to capture that and capture that in data form. And somehow Surgisphere is saying Africa did that. And uh, by the way, um, the number of associated deaths, this is very weird because remember, we don't have any. We have, ex we have no recorded cases of sudden unexplained death on hydroxychloroquine stretching back for 70 years all the way up until that WHO study that was put out in 2017. And suddenly, oh my gosh, it uh, uh, looks like, uh, you know, 40% of all deaths in the continent, uh, had, which had recorded, so this is weird. That just doesn't make sense. Okay, um, unusually small reported variances in baseline variables, interventions, and outcomes between continents. Yep, that's really, that stuff was super bizarre. I pointed out some of that on Tuesday. Uh, the mean daily doses of hydroxychloroquine that are 100 milligrams higher than FDA recommendations, where 66% of the data are from North American hospitals, yeah, very unlikely that North American hospitals are going to be administering at a higher dose than FDA recommendations because that's a, a foul and you can get in trouble. And of course, you expose yourself in lots of ways. So that's an unlikely. Implausible ratios of chloroquine to hydroxychloroquine use in some continents. Implausible, again, being very polite here. Um, and... Uh, and the tight 95% confidence intervals reported for the hazard ratios are unlikely. For instance, for the Australian data, this would need about double the numbers of recorded deaths as were reported in the paper. All right. Um, so 
Yeah, this all needs to be uh, looked at and looked at a lot. And uh, I won't read through the rest of it, but I will just scroll down here a little bit. Who signed on? Was this just a couple of uh, cranky doctors? Well, let's see. Um, no, Dr. James Watson from Thailand. We got the UK. We got researchers from Pennsylvania here. Let's see. Uh, we got clinicians, uh, researchers, more clinicians. Um, you got people from uh, uh, pharma companies in here. You got... Uh, you got all sorts of people from the public health here, uh, research units. Look at this. Look at this list of people. Look at this. I can't even. I can't even go all the way to here. Maybe if I lift this a little higher, I, yeah, I, we can get to the bottom of this list. Maybe. All right. So that's actually a pretty big list. And by the way, there's some really, really prominent people in here um, who uh, who you've heard about and read their names before as we've been going through this. So there's big names in here. And these big names are saying there's something really wrong with this study. And uh, this is super embarrassing to the Lancet here. All right, um, let's cut back here and uh, say, well, let's review. Where are we with hydroxychloroquine? Let's review. Hydroxychloroquine has been shown in clinical trials to be effective when given early and with zinc, right? Has been shown in clinical trials. I have the clinical trials. We've presented them before. There's some out of New York. There's uh, Didier Rouet stuff out of uh, Raouz, Raouz stuff out of France. We got we got a bunch of studies right now, and as well we have the the um, prep studies out of India, all saying, and that's the pre-exposure prophylaxis, right? We have all these studies saying that it's effective, and that it works, and it's data. It's actually solid data. Fauci says there's no evidence it works. The WHO says no evidence it works. Well, now HCQ has been shown, in quotes, to be uh, dangerous in retrospective data mining efforts, the most recent of which uses data of highly suspicious origin that nobody can review and conclusions that are completely preposterous. And Fauci immediately says, now proof exists that HCQ is dangerous. The WHO says proof exists that HCQ is dangerous. And um, as a reminder, remdesivir, remember, it failed to reduce mortality in two, not one, two solid double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And Fauci immediately declared remdesivir to be the standard of care, and the WHO adopts remdesivir as a frontline drug for investigation and keeps it there. They have a, a big five-arm study, including remdesivir in one of those arms, and they stopped the HCQ uh, trial, but kept the remdesivir one running. Uh, reactions across the world, besides that open letter, range from Spain, politely saying, uh, yeah, no. Um, so AEMPS, Spanish FDA, uh, they see cracks in the Lancet study being an observational study. It has a bias, and the doses used were very high, uh, bizarrely high. We have uh, had no such reports in our current trials with HCQ. We need to generate solid evidence. So uh, Spain just said, yeah, get out of here with your with your crap study. Um, Fauci bought it hook, line, and sinker immediately, of course, uh, and so did the WHO. And um, that speaks volumes to me about the integrity of uh, both that individual and that organization. A Yale epidemiologist came out uh, just today and said uh, HCQ should be ramped up immediately. And uh, this is the paper right here. Harvey A. Risch here is a um, in the Department of Chronic Disease Epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health, New Haven. And um, here's an article written about that uh, that just came out today, May 28th. And here's a great quote from it. It says, available evidence of efficacy of HCQ plus azithromycin, I need zinc in there, Harvey, give me some zinc, has been repeatedly described in the media as anecdotal, but most certainly is not. So stop with the anecdotal stuff. We have clinical data now. We've got gobs of it. It works, all right? That's what the clinical data says so far. A new article to be published in Oxford University Press on behalf of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health calls for HCQ and azithromycin to be made widely available and promoted immediately for physicians to be prescribed for early outpatient treatment. Early outpatient treatment. Outpatient, because it's not dangerous. Early, because that's when you do it. Professor Risch recognizes that in an ideal world, randomized double blind controlled clinical trials are preferable, yet regarding ongoing randomized trials with HCQ plus AZ, he notes, for the earliest trial between now and September, and that's, by the way, they set up the one trial that's going on in the United States so that it won't deliver any results until September. Why? Because they stuck in one 24-week secondary endpoint. Why? I don't know. To make it take till September? That's what I think happened. I think it's really that grotesque and uh, anti-scientific and inhumane. Uh, assuming a flat epidemic curve of 10,000 deaths per week, which I don't think is fair, but 
And I'll just give them that for the moment. I estimate that approximately 180,000 more deaths will occur in the U.S. before the trial results are known. In this context, we cannot afford the luxury of perfect knowledge and must evaluate now and on an ongoing basis the evidence for benefit and risk of these medications. So here you've got a big prominent uh, Yale uh, uh, infectious disease expert coming out saying we should be using this stuff. And by the way, Dr. Rish, uh, let's just put in a little something here. Um, zinc plus plus. We need a little zinc in there. Okay, thanks. That would be great. Um, but I love the early outpatient treatment. Uh, that all fits. So what are my conclusions for today? Well, first up, my faith and trust in scientists, in scientists and medical researchers and health agencies. Now it's just broken. This is grotesque what's been happening here. I'm angry. I'm angry for my profession, my chosen uh, love of science and scientists as a as a, a group of people. I am really upset with how they have gone about this. Uh, this Everything that just happened with the Lancet trial is actually a perfect case study in what's wrong with the entire system at this point in time. That study, by the way, is pure garbage, guaranteed. It was either politically motivated and derailed or money pharma conflicts of interest took over. Maybe it was both. And by money pharma conflicts of interest, you got to understand that all of the uh, MDs who are involved in that um, are routinely in the business of uh, taking money from pharma companies and companies like Gilead and things like that. So it, it under the best of circumstances, people have conflicts of interest. It's not something that you uh, disclose because you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, it's something that, that might influence you. They happen all the time. That's why we have to have these disclosures. I predict, uh, this paper is going to be retracted with, in, in a shameful blaze of, of, uh, of inglory. Uh, it, it is going to bring shame on all the parties involved, including Brigham Williams hospital, the Lancet. Uh, so institutional damage here as well. And the Lancet, I think is really outdone itself here. Um, and is now like Stanford, Pretty much on my, uh, I used to trust the Lancet. I'm not, I just don't anymore. This this reputational damage is really a powerful thing. Needs to be guarded against. That's why your editor-in-chief is a really important position. That editor has to be careful. They're not just trying to get great papers in, in their journal. They're trying to make sure that those great papers are not going to be this wrong. There were so many red flags uh, that immediately picked out in this particular study. And I think that the... Um, uh, in particular, that open letter surfaced so many of them so quickly, right? All of these concerns and so many professors and doctors uh, signed on so quickly that it's clear that whatever uh, the Lancet did, they certainly didn't have a proper review process because all that stuff would have been pulled up very quickly. I think in the rush to uh, harm HCQ of uh, so that uh, pharma companies could get it out of the way so they can sell more expensive medications. That was certainly part of the motivation. And probably it had to do with uh, uh, it's politically motivated because this could be a ding against Trump. And maybe there are other conflicts of interest I don't understand and know about yet. But this certainly wasn't science and it wasn't good science. And it's uh, really embarrassing. The media, too, has a role in this. I think they gleefully uh, promoted this study. They ran with it good and hard and the VA study, both of which I think are equally um, useless. And they're up to their ears in this whole mess, too. The media has some soul searching to do here as well, because anything that would risk human life and extend and prolong human misery instead of advancing the most appropriate sets of cures, the media has a big role in that. And by the way, it's, it's beyond even what happens to the individual patients, which I think is enough to uh, condemn the actions of all the participants in this little in this little. Uh, fiasco that's ongoing right here. But for everybody involved, we can get back to opening things back up and returning, <clears throat> excuse me about that, and returning to work as soon as we possibly can, if and only if we have effective treatments. And we have to have good science to figure out what the effective treatments actually are. All right. The campaign against uh, hydroxychloroquine is anything but scientifically driven, anything but humane. It's deliberate. And it needs to be seen that way. And I'm wondering what the consequences ought to be for people who deliberately derail science and harm patients for whatever reasons they happen to have. And it reveals a profound lack of integrity. That's why I do what I do. I care about integrity. I care about uh, honesty. I care about science. I care about rational, reasonable conclusions. And none of those um, really, I think, are negotiable for me personally. They're not. They're just not. 
All right. Um, remember, uh, you know, part of it's taking the right medicines, part of it, the rest of it is just not catching this thing in the first place. And uh, having a very healthy immune system that your terrain is properly fortified with the kinds of macro and micronutrients that are often missing from our sick foods, our standard American diet, the SAD diet, uh, because of industrial farming that has harvested all the macro and micronutrients out of the soil, turned it into dirt. And uh, there's just not enough stuff in there, good stuff like selenium, or people aren't getting enough D3 or uh, needing more zinc in their diet and things like that. Because these are all things we used to get from our diets, harder to come by now. Um, And there's a whole story around that too, which I won't get into right this second. All right. And uh, we're going to talk here about uh, joining the movement in just a second. Hi, everyone. Chris Martinson here with Evie, my fiance. Hi. Hey, everybody. So I want to tell you, and we want to tell you about these t-shirts right here. This is one of my favorite t-shirts to wear. It's a Peak Prosperity Resilience t-shirt. He never takes it off, actually. I can hardly wash it. You can see I got paint on it and stuff already. So I'm getting another one soon. And you can too. Our supplier has been out of business for a while, shut down by COVID coming back online so these shirts are ready again i want to tell you about them because if you wear these then this is part of the movement that we've got going on and you will help be able to identify each other on the street you'll see other people walking around with these t-shirts and you'll know you're part of the tribe that loves data loves logic part of the remnant that's out there who can actually see things for what they are so just want to let you know about that peakprosperity.com slash shirts you can come and find these if you're ready to order them up and i'm not kidding One of my favorite t-shirts. Did I mention 100% organic cotton? Very comfortable. Oh, by the way, there's a tree on the other side. Oh, yeah. Got the peak prosperity tree there. And made in the USA. So with all of that said, uh, stop on by if you want to get one. Just want to let you know about that. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Be safe. Remember, plant a garden uh, if you can. And uh, this is my new garden here in my new place here in Western Mass. With all of that said, thank you very much for listening, and uh, we'll talk to you. Remember, we're doing this Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'll be back with you this coming Tuesday. All right. Take care, everyone. Be well. Hi, folks. This is Adam Taggart, Chris's co-founder at Peak Prosperity. To get your own resilient shirt, simply go to peakprosperity.com slash shirts. Each shirt is made of 100% organic cotton and produced in the USA. And when your shirt arrives... Please send us a photo of you wearing it if you feel comfortable doing so. We'll add you to our wall of proud Peak Prosperity members who are showing the world that resilience is the way to a better future. Thanks for watching.